Hey, how many people are simple people in the room today? Okay. How many of you uh, overcomplicated that question immediately? <laughs> All right. Does he mean like unintelligent or uninteresting or white bread? You know, okay. Sometimes we have the ability to overcomplicate simple things. We just way overthink it sometimes. It's like dinner, gonna go out. Chick fil A or Chipotle? How many people need a pros and cons list, a spreadsheet to figure out that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, how many people are just like, it's dinner, it does not matter, open a can of black beans and just eat it with a spoon. <laughs> that's my wife and that's me. In both of those scenarios, I'll let you figure out who's who in that scenario. Sometimes we can just overcomplicate simple, simple things. Hey, today, as we're kind of heading into fall, how many people are still summer mode right now? Okay, wow, a lot of y'all. Okay, how many people are like full on fall pumpkin spice latte? Like, yeah, like how many people are flannel? <laughs> that is the unchurchiest thing I've ever seen is to literally boo people in church because of their just coffee decisions. It's insane. I can't believe that just happened. Well, we're here, whether or not you're in summer mode or fall mode, we're sending our kids back to school. Probably we're putting away the camping gear. Summer vacation's probably over. We're probably at least beginning to sense that the season of change is coming. As we kind of begin our fall routines and start gathering ourselves, whether you're emotionally ready for it or not, pumpkin spice lattes are at Starbucks now, whether you're ready. As we gather and go into this moment, we wanted to kind of uh, pause or just start a new series um, as we kind of guide our time into the fall season. Uh, we're calling this series Simple Healthy Church. Simple Healthy Church. And the reason that we're doing this is sometimes we can overcomplicate what faith in church looks like. There's just so many programs and practices and small groups and books and sermons and classes and ideas. And it's like, which one of those things do I grab onto sometimes? Sometimes it's so easy to feel maybe overwhelmed or like there's too many options of things out there to do. This sermon series started as a conversation between me and a church leader almost six years ago. We were in my office and we were just talking about church and, and programmings and stuff. And we had this question of what makes a strong church? What makes a healthy church? And after we were talking, it kind of came out with a couple few fundamental focuses that if a church would focus, if a community group would focus on these things, I think you would result in a healthy church. And, and honestly, the ingredients are pretty simple. I think that a healthy church at its core has these fundamental focuses of people that love God first. They just, it's a God first living. We put God first. People practicing to become like Jesus, not just learn about Jesus, to become like him. Godly marriages, people that focus on their spouse and put their spouse before others. Biblical parenting and families. People that build and raise their families to know God, to love him, to, to understand what the Bible says about parenting, and a church that's marked or at least growing in a sense of love. God first living, becoming like Jesus, godly marriage, biblical practices marked by love. And that's pretty simple, right? Do you agree? Simple people, you out there? Like, it's not, that's not hard. But if you've been in church for a while, been around faith for a while, grown up in it, grown spent any time in Christianity, you can realize that's like a pretty easy thing to say, but sometimes it's really hard to implement those simple things. Sometimes it's hard to get those simple things to be practical things, to actually see them. Sometimes we get so distracted by other things, we neglect those simple building blocks. Ronald Rollheiser, in his book, The Holy Longing, he says, we live in a world that is rich in most everything except clarity in the area of spirituality. It is, not easy. it is not easy to know how we should live out what is essential within our lives of faith. Concretely, what should we be doing? To whom should we be listening? Even though we may have accepted a creed, been baptized into a church, and are familiar with the Bible, we are still constantly subjected to voices calling us in different directions. Daily, we face a perplexing series of questions. Is this important or not? Is this something of substance or just fad? Will this endure? Will it pass away? Must I get involved in this or can I choose to ignore it? Is this church and is this teaching right or wrong? Is this something essential or merely accidental? So with that as our guiding quote, 
we're starting today this series on Simple Healthy Church. If we had to stop everything we were doing, if we had to pause all of our programs, reformat and rebegin, what would be those core fundamental things that as a community of faith we would focus on and give our attention to? And I believe it's these couple of things. God first living, becoming like Jesus, spouse first, biblical parenting, and growing in love. Can we just pause and just pray and invite God's presence um, here in this service? Lord, we recognize that you are here and that you want to commune with us, and we welcome that. I pray these are not just words spoken from a stage through a microphone, but God, I pray that they are words of life that guide us towards you, deeper knowledge and intimacy with you. That it's not merely information, but spirit breathed words, Father, that lead us into relationship with you. And everyone said, Amen. 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 In the book of Titus, Paul is instructing his student Titus on how to raise a healthy church, basically. He's saying, commission these elders who will create more leaders, who will create pockets of community that are healthy. And he has this really interesting guiding line in chapter 1, verse 9, in regards to a leader. He says, he must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he'll be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are are wrong. These are pretty simple steps, right? God, Jesus, spouse, kids, love. These are gospel values, but our willingness to show up to them, to dedicate ourselves to these foundational steps starts with a belief. Do we actually believe the Bible and the good news it teaches? I just said a bunch of stuff. Do you actually believe that those are the fundamental focuses we should give our life towards before we focus on all the programs and teaching and podcasts and books and all the other things that Christian Christianity has to offer. What is your belief? And so before we kind of talk about those things, I kind of want to uh, set the table to say, like, for this series by just talking and spending the rest of the time we have today about the power of belief. And that's really what we're talking about is the power of belief. Because belief's an interesting thing. It, it's this invisible governing force that motivates what we do in return. It demonstrates who we are and what we believe in by what we're doing. Belief shapes our steps, it guides our doings, it, it creates the verbs in your life. The things that you're doing come from the beliefs that are buried in your life. Brief illustration, some of us grew up believing in a Nordic wizard that had a fixation on cookies and good manners and uncanny ability to sneak up and down chimneys, and because of that, are you with me, wink, wink? We acted really, really good around the holidays. Our belief changed what we do. Some of us were unwilling to walk under ladders because of some superstitions. I grew up believing and practicing that when I passed a cemetery, I had to hold my breath, otherwise I'd get dead man's breath. Anybody with me? That, that's, that's a farm town Huntington kind of thing. That ain't an Illinois kind of thing. But that's what I believed. I don't want to have bad breath. I don't want to have bad man's breath. All of us have beliefs. And these beliefs govern and shape what we do and how you live your life. So do you agree with me that these things are good? Yes, maybe, but do your beliefs agree that those things are good and worth your time and attention? What if our beliefs are built on things that aren't necessarily true? We can have beliefs that aren't true at all. We all know people that believe things that are lies, that believe things that are wrong. Like maybe you... Holding your breath around a cemetery doesn't actually affect you biologically, you know? Like, maybe that's not a real thing. So what if your beliefs are built on lies instead of truths? Not that long ago, doctors, doctors were the models for advertising that cigarettes were healthy for you. What about when we base our tr truths on things that are personal to us? And John Mark Comer uses this example in his book, Live No More Lies, Live No Lies, that if you believe you're unlovable, at some point in your life, as a child or adolescent or whatever, broken relationship, that you picked up this message, I am an unlovable, unworthy person, that belief will govern and filter every relationship you have. If, if you believe that, you will allow yourself to be disrespected and demeaned by others. If you believe that, you will in turn disrespect and dismean dis dis others. If you believe that, you will not allow yourself to be loved because you have a belief that you are unlovable. 
Belief is an odd and powerful force in our life. What we believe matters because it affects everything that we do. Out of our belief comes our doing. So it's easy to say that a simple, healthy church focuses on these couple of areas. But even right now, in just a moment, this is not a talk, this is just a conversation leading us towards God, is pause. I've said it a bunch of times. God, Jesus, spouse, marriage, love. The last couple of months, last couple of, this last week, does your life reflect a, a belief that these things are core and fundamental? Our willingness to put God first, to submit to Christ's authority, sacrifice our marriage, to love our kids well, to give our time and money and talent to others will depend on what we believe. But here's the tricky thing with belief is that they are formed and they are not forced. I can say all of these things and we can agree with our heads nodding, but if we believe that there is a better way to live life, then it will not matter very much. Very early in my walk with Jesus, um, uh, I went to the Bible college, and I, I just came back with this burning desire to turn people towards heaven. And I did that with a very negative mindset of thinking that if I could just scare them enough or confront them enough with their sin that they would turn. And this is still a common tactic now. And on one of my first breaks home, I, I went and took each of my uh, siblings aside and quietly but persistently showed them all of their sin, all of the wrong, showed them, you are going to hell unless you say this prayer. And just to let you know, taxes aside, I got three yeses for Jesus that day from all of them. But none of my siblings would say that their faith journey started with that conversation being forced to say yes to Jesus. Dallas Willard in his book, Renovation of the Heart, he says, we never choose to believe and we must not try to get ourselves or others to choose to believe. That is God's work. We can try to understand and try to help others understand. Beyond that, God must work. Belief will come as God's gift within the hidden depths of our life and will grow under the nurturing of the word and the spirit. You cannot force yourself to believe something. Belief, much like a changing season, is kind of like a mystery. One day you wake up and you're here and you despise pumpkin spice lattes. But one day you wake up and all you can think about is getting a pumpkin spice latte. Something in overnight changed and now summer is gone and fall is here. What is that remarkable difference for you? C.S. Lewis uh, in his book uh, Surprised by Joy talks about how one day he got onto a motorcycle as an unbeliever. And something in the course of that trip, he got off knowing there is a God. You cannot force yourself. I I could invite you right now and say, come up and and change your belief and take a step off this stage and really believe you're not going to fall. If you do this, if you could really believe you won't fall, I'll even give you $100. That might be enough to take your family to McDonald's these days, okay? And so if you come up, really believe. None of you, none of us could change our belief because we've grown up knowing from the time we're a child trying to learn how to walk that ups have downs and we can't just force ourselves to believe something that we don't. So good luck with that and go figure it out. I hope you have a good Sunday. You cannot force yourself, but you can form your beliefs. You can create opportunities of influence where your beliefs can change over time. And that's really where we're spending the rest of the time we have first. So God first living, do I, do I actually believe this or do I believe that my best and happiest life comes from putting something else before God first in my time, my talent, and my money and how I spend my life? Becoming like Jesus, do I, do I actually believe that or do I find that life hard and toilsome? unenjoyable, that it pushes back on my wants and desires and we put those over our desire to become like Jesus. Godly marriage, that's, that's great, but it's, it's hard work. You know, your marriage is never perfected. It, it's just a constant fire that has to be either tended or it dwindles. And that's hard work. And sometimes it, it, we, it's like, of course I want to love my spouse and put them first, but there's other things that I prioritize and put ahead of them. 
Of course, we want to love our kids and, and grow them, but parenting is hard and it's difficult, and sometimes you're just trying to get to the end of the day. Sometimes there's so many things to do, and our lives reflect that our beliefs are different than what we say. And of course, a church should be growing love, but it's so easy to get derailed and focused on other things that could easily sabotage that. So what do we do with all of this? How if we cannot force our beliefs and we want them to match our desires and we want them to match the knowledge in we had. What do we do? How can we form new structures to grow in our life? You cannot force yourself or others to believe things, but you can form and influence and lay groundwork for new thoughts and make way for new beliefs to grow in you. Recently we found in uh, the church that we had some water coming into the basement. And we found this because there's water pooled around the outside perimeter of the church and the, it's just sitting there and it's starting to leak in. And, and so one thing, one option is to shrug your shoulders at that and just say, well, I guess that's how it is. We'll just let it keep coming in. There's nothing we can, maybe we'll paint the wall, but there's nothing we can really do. And the other option is to maybe perhaps dig new trenches Put in some more drainage. Create an opportunity for the water to move a different direction. And that's kind of what I want to get the point across today is that you cannot force yourself to just suddenly believe that God for its living is the best way to do. But you can do things and put practices and create areas in your life to form new beliefs in you. There's so much that can be said on this. We could go an apologetic route where we talk about God's knowability, the Bible's authority. We could talk about the historical importance and significance of Jesus' life and how it's something you could trust. There's so many areas that we could, and this message has gone a bunch of different ways, but I came back to the point that this series is called Simple Healthy Church. And I'm really trying to create simple messages that we could practically implement. And so if you don't get anything else, this is the whole message in one sentence. We must form our beliefs on truth, uh, on the truth of the gospel and the truth of God. How we do this is by knowing and experiencing God, showing up as we are, where we are, as we're able. We must form our beliefs on the truth of the gospel and the truth of God. How we do this is by knowing and experiencing God, showing up as we are, where we are, as we are able. Again, Paul said, we must have a strong belief in this trustworthy message. But the question is, how? I grew up, I, I had this strong, strong belief in that we have as humans a robust personal immunity. I, do, I don't believe in preheating the oven. I don't believe in following recipes. And I certainly don't believe that you will die from not washing your fruit, okay? Some, I just lost half of the room on that one, <laughs> including my wife. But I'm just going to say I'm a product. I haven't died yet, okay? So... One time we were on vacation with my family out in farm territory and there happened to be a cherry orchard that was connected to the place we were staying. We were given full license to go and to partake of the cherries. And so I found myself halfway up a tree eating more cherries than I was gathering. And just, I love cherries. If you haven't heard this, my favorite food in the whole world is a bucket of cherries. And so I was just eating all these cherries. Later on that day, we, we met some of the children of the people that own the place and work the land. And we're talking with them. And I was asking them, do you guys go up and eat all the cherries? I was up there eating all the cherries. And they adamantly shook their head and say, no, we call those bird killers. I said, what? They were talking about the chemicals they put on the cherries that they kill the birds. And what I want to let you know is, guess what? I wash the cherries that I eat now after having that conversation. <laughs> Knowledge can form your belief. You can go into something having a belief, but if you gain more knowledge about the situation, your belief can change and can form differently. In Ephesians 1, Paul's great primer and letter to the church, his first prayer of multiple prayers in this beautiful message was that people, the people, we the church, would grow in our knowledge of God. That was his first and primary thing he wanted to happen, is that you would grow in your knowledge of God, that God, the, the, the light of Christ would flood your hearts and you'd experience him. The more that you know about God, the more your belief in your life and your heart will be formed in and after his image. The most accessible place that we have to grow in our knowledge of God is this book right here. 
All of you probably have it on your phones. You probably have multiple translations of this. If you do not have a Bible, we can get you hooked up with the Bible before you leave church today. Just come back to that, that black box or that black table back there and we'll get you a Bible. But this is the most practical place that you can get more knowledge of God. But even with that, listen to this quote. This is Tim Allen. He posted this on X this last Tuesday. He said, I've never taken the time in all my years to ever read and really read the Bible. Currently, almost through the Jerusalem Bible Old Testament and almost done with the prophets. Next up to the New Testament. So far, amazing. And not at all what I was expecting. This was last Tuesday. I think two and a half million views, 800,000 like reshares, blah, 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 lots of stuff. But what I want to say is that Tim Allen's been public about his faith for years, 71 years old, and just now actually reading his Bible and realizing that God is not what he thought or what he expected. We are in a Bible, even if it's post-Christian, we are in a Bible-saturated culture. And it's very easy to grow up Bible-adjacent but to not actually read the Bible and the word for yourself. I love Laura's testimony as she got into the baptism tank is that she read her Bible and that she got to know God and she realized that that changed everything. And so knowledge can change your beliefs. And one of the easiest ways is to just simply read your Bible. I have been reading my Bible quite literally my whole life. As, as, as early as I could read, I've been reading this book. And still I come to passages that I do not understand. Still I come to passages I've read. I'm like, I have read this for 30 years and I've not actually done it. I come to passages that I've read and reread and taught sermons on and taught Bible studies on and still get new revelation, new knowledge on. I have been in this book for so long and do not feel like an expert on it. I do feel like I've been in this book so long and it still gives me revelation and knowledge of a God that I'm trying to learn and know. If I can be honest with you, I struggle with the Bible at times. There's parts of it that are hard to understand, the parts of it I don't like. There's so many names and genealogies and numbers, and Leviticus is so difficult to get through. God, where are you in this? We'll do a series on that sometime, I'm sure. But I do believe this, that if you keep showing up and you keep reading it and you keep putting this in your life, that you will begin it has a power to it that begin to form you to understand, to recognize, and to encounter God as a person and not just as words. And so the very first place that we could start is simply just read your Bible. Get into his word. Re listen to good, wholesome, biblical teaching. Get into a small group with other people. Buy yourself a commentary or a book that will help you, not just a devotion, not just a good news, not just motivational messages, but a book that will help you understand this and read it. And you may be surprised about the God you find. The second way that we could come to our Bible and begin creating avenues for new beliefs to form in our life. Not just any beliefs. Let me be clear on this. Beliefs built on truth. Not just any haphazard beliefs, beliefs that we have adopted, beliefs that we think, things that we like about God or want to apply to the church. Beliefs built on truths. Not truths that we said are true, but truths of God's word that are shaping our lives. Another way to build true beliefs in our life is to experience God. You know, the primary way that the disciples and the other believers ex uh, uh, were changed by Jesus was that they experienced him. They were with him all the time. They saw him do miracles. They were fed by him. They were healed. They were delivered. They loved. They were taught. They, they walked with him, and they sat with him, and they slept where he was going, and they were commissioned by him. They spent time with him. They experienced God, and that formed their beliefs about God. Even when they thought they had lost Jesus, when he came back, they said, man, we thought that this was the Messiah. We are so saddened. And Jesus reveals himself to them, and their belief is confirmed. So you can experience this now. John chapter 14, this is Jesus. He said, I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Jesus is no longer here in body on earth, but he went and sent a representative of the tri triune nature of God, the Holy Spirit. 
which is a being here with purpose, is to teach you and to lead you. To give you opportunity to not just know God, but to experience him. And to even take the knowledge that you're gaining from this and to teach you and to lead you and to confront you and to gently lead you into God's image. And so you, you may be here and you're like, I, I've been in the Bible my whole life. But have you paired that knowing with experience of God? Because the knowing and the experience can lead to true beliefs built about God. I remember when I was in my, uh, yeah, my teens, early walks of my faith in college. And I remember just wrestling with how I was living versus what I knew about God and what I was learning about God. And one night we were on a conference and I was just sick. I was, I was sick physically and I was sick just spiritually. I was just down and depressed and sad and just like struggling and trying to mash all this stuff together and just mad. And I, I, I told you, I grew up in the Bible. I've been reading it forever, 20 years of reading it. And it's just like, it's not clicking. I have these strongholds of sin in my life. I can't push through. I don't understand. I'm always sad. I'm mad. And so we go to this conference and... Everybody's going to, uh, I can't remember what it was, but they had a big thing and it was fun or whatever. But I stayed back in the room. I stayed back by myself, just wrestling with all this stuff. Wrestling with this unbelief and belief and just frustrated. And at this conference grounds, they had a, a, a tall hill and a path you get up there and just a big cross. Um, and so I snuck out by myself and it was nighttime, kind of perfect weather. And so I walk up this I didn't know it at the time, but really it was a pilgrimage and walking up this mountain and by myself with all of this frustration, all this pain. And I get up there and I can't tell you what happened. All I know is that I experienced God. That knowledge actually came and met me. And that I was able to release things and know that God is real and be able to experience him in my life. And all I can say is that that experience is here and available for you too. It's not for the spiritual elite. It's not for the people that know their Bible backwards and forwards. That God is a person who wants to meet you. And this really is our next point. That Jesus in John 14, 6 said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Do you realize that he is saying, I am truth and the truth is a person? And so all of this knowledge and all of this experience is just not so that you can just experience and say, wow, we saw amazing things happen in church, or wow, I know my Bible so well. It's so that you can begin to know a being. It's so that you begin to grow in relationship with God. And so the knowing and the experiencing leads you towards an actual being, that the truth is a person who is knowable, that you can grow in relationship with God. I, I, I've been married to my wife now for a decade. And I think back, I'm like, what in the world was I doing? I didn't even know this person when I married her. That's how it feels. I'm like, but over time and as we get closer, I'm realizing that I know her better and know how she ticks and know how she thinks, but she still surprises me. Our relationship is growing over time. And our love is deepening. And I think the same can be true of us with God, is that through knowledge, through wisdom, we can experience him and know his presence more in our life. Uh, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, when I first came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words, impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness Timid and trembling. Does that sound like a sermon you want to hear? Not really. And my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. You may be here today and you may be on one side of the fence. Maybe you have grew up in the Bible and you know your Bible really well. Well, the Pharisees were the people that knew their Bible really well, and they crucified Jesus. And maybe you're on the other side of the fence, and you grew up in a culture like ours, and you've experienced God a lot. Like, you really know, like, you've seen God move. But there's a guy named Simon in the book of the Bible that moved in spiritual power, and he saw the Holy Spirit, and he tried to buy it, and he was cursed. Because he thought it was a force he could just buy and take and use as his control. 
And so we're not trying to just grow in our knowledge just so we know the Bible better or grow in our experience of God just so we can see cool things happen. We're trying to grow in these things so that we would begin to know God and our beliefs would begin to be matched and built on truth. Amen, Church in the Rock? I'd like to just end today with a gospel story. Um, I don't know where the room's at today. You may be sitting here today and you're just kind of like, you know what? Amen, amen, amen. Check, check, check. And you're good. Um, but maybe you're here today and you're new to faith or you've been struggling with faith or probably aspects of faith or knowledge or you're realizing already that there are some of those things that I listed that you, you don't really believe in or really implement in your life. So I don't, I don't know where we are today, but I felt like I was led to this story and I feel like it does a really good job of grabbing us all and bringing us in to Jesus today. So to give you the context of the story, right before this, Jesus goes up onto this mountain in this moment called the transfiguration. And Jesus puts on from his earthly bodily form, he transforms into his heavenly form. And so he's glowing and it's white and it's just power is radiating. And then Elijah and Moses show up and they're glowing and white and power is radiating. And as this, he just took a couple disciples, uh, Peter and John and one other, and they're up there and they just freak out. They don't know what to do. Like, they, they're like, should we build you a house? Like, what, what do we do? And then boom, everything's over. Everything diminishes and they're just back to normal. So there's just powerhouse moment in the Holy Spirit and everything's back to normal and they come back down the mountain. As they're coming back down the mountain, they begin to hear a crowd yelling and they see a crowd growing. And as they make their way up, they figure out what's happening and they're coming down for this moment into the crowd and there's a debate happening, a spiritual debate. And it's between Jesus' disciples and his followers and the Pharisees. And the problem is that a father had brought his son who had a demonic spirit on him, and they said, please heal him. The disciples couldn't heal him, and that caused a major debate and fight. And as this is happening, a crowd's growing because, remember, no Netflix, no YouTube, so this is prime entertainment. So everybody's getting there and seeing what's happening, and that brings us to this moment where Jesus enters the scene. So Jesus ignores the squabbling, ignores the crowd, and all the distractions, and he focuses on the father and son, and this is Mark chapter 9, verse 20. They brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. He fell to the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood, it is often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if I can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him, never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. What a statement and what a prayer. What a brutally honest, pure moment of truth from the Father. I believe, help my unbelief. I kind of want to just give a space and a moment here to um, have that same invitation and freedom to respond as we are, as the Father got to do that with Jesus. Some of us here today may be struggling with just even showing up at church every week or the concept of reading your Bible or, or you hear about hearing from God, or experiencing God, and you've never felt that in your life and you're questioning if you could actually feel that or if that's real. Some of you may be struggling in your faith of just even like you're showing up, you're putting on the front, you're like you're trying to do the things, but it's just not working, it's not clicking. And I, I just want to give us an invitation to just be honest with God in this moment. You don't have to prove anything to anybody here. You don't have to do anything. You just want to give you an honest moment to be with God. So you can assess where you are and invite God to lead you to what's next. And why I love this prayer so much is because it's so honest. Because I have felt this tension of, I believe, but help my unbelief. Like, I, I, I believe, I want to believe, but I, I don't believe. I don't have the faith to match it. Would you just help me in this moment? I love this because... Jesus speaks the truth. I can do anything. 
But he's not a bully. He's not going to force you. He's not going to make you do anything. He's waiting for that invitation to walk with you towards truth. If we can go to worship blotting for just a moment, please, as we kind of close in here. So I just take a moment. If you would, go ahead and close your eyes and just to get, because this is between you and the Lord. And I just take inventory of where you're at today. What parts of today's scripture or message or service, what, what things is your mind or spirit being drawn to? What pictures and feelings are coming up? Are, are you feeling anxious or worried or angry? Are you feeling at peace and calm? And just invite God into that moment. In just a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to be quiet for just a m- now. Just Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you be gentle and would you speak to us and lead us towards you?